Welcome to the Florisage Podcast, a place where we help you create a life you're excited about. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so glad that you've returned. In last week's episode, we spoke about the law of assumption and the effortless way, according to Neville Goddard. And you also learned that assumption is the what and that imagination is the how. You also tried this out for yourself and did the latter experiment. Today, we're gonna take this a step further and talk about the action involved with the law of assumption and the effortless way. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, Flora. Last week you said all we have to do is assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled and we have that thing, right? Yes, but we're gonna break it down so that you can see that action is part of all of this thing. So, did you do the exercise or the experiment and were you successful? Now, I gotta say, I was super pumped and super excited about all the messages that I got from you guys who chose to message me who indeed and in fact climbed a ladder. Now, some of you guys told me the most incredible, most serendipitous situations that gave you cause to climb a ladder. So you started with the visualization of climbing a ladder. That was an action. You visualized yourself standing there, ladder in front of you, arms raised up, hands on the rungs, and you visioned yourself climbing up that ladder. You also then were put in certain situations based off of that one action of visualization, which slowly led you to be in a situation that caused you to actually climb a ladder. So those tiny actions were the result of the assumption of already having climbed the ladder. Like your brain has gone through the experience of you climbing the ladder when you, when you, you know, visualized it. And when you put this into your experience, it must come to pass. To illustrate this, I wanna share with you how my experiment went with this when I did it the first time. But before I do that, I wanna share another quote from another favorite author of mine, Wallace D. Waddles. And he says, quote, by desire that thing is brought to you, by action you receive it. By desire, that thing is brought to you. So that thing is whatever that thing is that you want. By action, you receive it. So the first time I did this experiment, I visualized it once, sitting at my dining room table while watching a YouTube video that talked about this that said, this is a ladder experience. And I was like, oh, what is this? And I clicked on it and was like, oh my God. So as the person was sharing this experience or you know the visualization I literally was visualizing this at my kitchen table and I allowed myself to fully immerse myself in that visualization I did it one time that weekend we were sitting you know hey what do you want to do I don't know what do you want to do oh hey let's go look at RVs so we randomly decide to go RV shopping and lo and behold when we were in one of the RVs there was a loft that had, you guessed it, a ladder that if we wanted to see what it looked like up there, we needed to climb the ladder to do it. Now, it didn't hit me until that night when I was laying in bed and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God. And I even said it, I was like, oh my God, I climbed a fucking ladder. And my partner was like, oh my God, you did. Oh my God, and it was so funny. And I was floored because I only imagined it once. That was it. I didn't do the three night thing. I didn't say that affirmation. So shortly after that, it was probably about a week or two later, I was falling asleep. And again, I was playing around with it. I imagined I climb a ladder. I did this one time. The next day, I was cooking dinner with my partner and I heard a large chirp, which we've all heard if you have smoke detectors in your house. And I was like, seriously, we literally just changed these batteries a month before. And I was like, what the heck? And again, I waited. I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's not what it is. Yep, another loud chirp. I was like, hmm. Well, 
he was arm deep in like slicing and dicing. So I went to the garage, grabbed the ladder, grabbed a battery out of the hall closet, plopped it open, climbed the ladder, and I'm literally in mid-chain. She's like, oh my God, babe, you're climbing a ladder. Did you do the visualization again? And I'm like, oh my God, I did it last night. And we laughed and laughed and laughed. And I was like, seriously? <laughs> now, this is not the first time I experimented with these types of concepts of manifesting and bringing something into my life. So I wanna take you back to 2004 and I want to share a story with you of an experience that changed my life that is in alignment with Neville's teachings. And if you've been following me for a while, you've heard this story. If not, you are in for a wild ride, my friend. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right. Back in the year 2003, I had just gotten my second divorce. I was done with life. I was like, you know, everybody's nuts. This is bullshit. I'm going to run away. <laughs> I didn't say I was running away. I was like, I'm just going to like relocate and start fresh, whatever. I was running away from myself. In any case, I gave everything I owned away and moved myself and my two boys to South Africa. It was a shit show, did not work out, realized you can't run away from yourself. I need to work on my crap um, in order for my life to finally get better. So moved back home. I lived with my sister in her spare bedroom. So I essentially was homeless. I was jobless and just wallowed in my self-pity. And so I enrolled the boys in school there and when they were not in school, we all went to the library and just immersed ourselves in books and all kinds of things. And I had all of these design and um, you know housing books. I just I love looking at interior design. All these books are out, and I was just envisioning a different life than the one that I had. And I saw this book. It was called Write It Down, Make It Happen by Dr. Henriette Clauser. And it says, figuring out what you want and getting it. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I need this book. <laughs> so I read just enough to be dangerous. I didn't read the entire thing. I kind of paged through it and picked apart certain things. And what I got from the book was four steps. First, figure out what you want. Second, write it down. Third, put it where you can see it every day. And four, expect it to happen. So I was like, all right, cool. So if I can manifest whatever, and she didn't use the word manifest. She's like, what do you want? Let's get it for you. Let's get what you desire. So I was like, okay. So I was like, what do I want? I'm, I want I want, a, I want a new car. So I didn't want a brand spanking new car, like fresh off the lot, but I wanted one that was reliable, that was a very low maintenance vehicle. So I was like, well, if I want a new car, I probably need to get cash so that I can purchase a car. So that's what I wrote on my piece of paper, cash for a car paid in full. The second thing that I wanted was, you know, I really want to go to college. Um, at this point in my life, I was in the Marine Corps. I did supply. And then from there, I did accounting, receivables, um, stuff like that. And, you know, admin work. And I really just wasn't feeling it. I wanted to do something else. I'm a people person. I did not like sitting behind a desk. And so I'm like, I want to go to college. But I don't want to have to pay for it because I don't have the money. So I want a full scholarship. And then I said, you know, better yet, since I'm shooting for the moon, I want somebody to pay me to go to college. And like I said, I did not know what was possible. I was just like, I'm shooting for the moon. Let's do this. So I want somebody to pay me to go to college. And I want a full scholarship. So two weeks goes by after I put this up on my wall. Nothing happens. And then I get this little knowing, this little blip in my head that said, okay, if you do get the money right now, what kind of a car would you want? And I was like, oh shit, okay, I need to, I need to figure this out. So it was between a Hyundai Elantra or a Toyota Echo. 
And at the dealerships, the Echo was going for like 13.5 to 12.5. So not a lot, but not, you know, a little. Like that was, it was a pretty reasonably priced vehicle. The Elantra was a little bit more, and I was really leaning more towards an Echo. So I went onto this website called carsoup.com. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I found an Echo that was just like two years old. Maybe it was just a year and a half old for $8,500. And I was like, oh, okay. So I call and I said, hey, what's wrong with the car? Why? Because again, the dealerships were selling them for around 13000 She goes, oh, nothing's wrong with it. My daughter um, is an expat. She's overseas. Um, it's paid for. We're just getting rid of it for her. And I was like, okay, cool. I hang up. Nothing more for two weeks. So no signs of any cash coming in. And I'm like, oh, geez. Okay. So after those two weeks go by, again, I get this little blip in my brain that says, hey, you need to file your taxes. So the year before, I was working for Northwest Airlines as a contractor. So I was working through another company that hired me to work at Northwest Airlines. And it was a nine-month contract. And when I was getting my taxes done, the person that was doing my taxes just kept looking at me kind of what, you know, weird. I'm like, what, dude? Like, do I have something on my face or what? And he brought his manager over. The manager did all of my taxes. And he's like, yeah, this is right. And I got $8,009 back. And I was like, what? Apparently, when Northwest Airlines paid the contracting company, they took taxes out for me on my behalf. And then the contracting company then took taxes out of that. So they double withheld, so which in turn gave me a tax return of $8,009. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I called the lady back. I literally like ran home as fast as I could. And I called the lady and I said, hey, would you take 8,000 cash? And she said, sold. And I was like, yay. The only problem was I was in West St. Paul and she was in Libertyville, Illinois. So I was in, I was in you know, like Minnesota. She was in Illinois. There's a whole state in between those. So I called my stepsister. I said, hey, do you want to go on a road trip? She's like, absolutely, let's do this. So I go to the bank, I get a cashier's check for $8,000, and we road trip to Libertyville, Illinois, sight unseen, okay? I've never driven an Echo, I never test drove one. Drive there, it's awesome, the lady is hysterical, she's so freaking amazing. Give her the cashier's check, and I drive home in my brand new Echo, and I was like, oh my goodness. I had that Echo for from 2004 through um, just like two years ago. So this, it's 2022. So, you know, I, I was like, and it last, nothing ever went wrong with it. It was the most reliable car I've ever had. So during this same time, I was working with a VA rep, since I am a veteran, um, to try to find a job. And, and I was also on unemployment. So he was trying to you know, help me get employment that would pay for an apartment, daycare, groceries, gas, all that stuff. And I just got burnt out. And he's like, why have you stopped looking for a job? And I said, nobody's hiring me. They all say that I need to stick with accounting. I don't like accounting. I don't even have a, a, a you know, like degree in accounting. It was just my experience in the Marine Corps which is more logistics. It's like supply. It's ordering stuff. Um, but he goes, <clears throat> well, um, do you have anything that happened to you while you were in the service that still bothers you? I'm like, well, yeah, I had a skydiving accident and broke my back. And he's like, oh, are you service connected disabled? And I said, no, I'm not. So we did the paperwork, got my exam and I became 10% service connected disabled. And with that, I could apply for a scholarship through the VA. So it's this thing called voc rehab or vocational rehabilitation that helps veterans gain um, employment and gain uh, credentials so that they can have long-term employment. So we fill out the paperwork and I didn't really understand all the ins and outs of it. He's just like, here, fill this out. 
and we'll see what we can do. And he goes, it's a long shot, but we'll just see. I'm like, all right, cool. So we fill out the paperwork. I go for my interview, do the interview, and the you know vet rep says, okay, it's probably going to be about three months before we hear anything. And I'm like, all right, cool. Three days later, I get a phone call from him, and he says, I don't know what you did or what you said in that interview, but you got awarded Vogue Rehab. And he goes, I have never seen this happen before. I'm like, you're the one that told me to try for it. He goes, no, no, yeah. I said it was a long shot. In order to qualify for Vogue Rehab, you have to be 30% service-connected, disabled, or more. I was only 10%. He goes, like I said, I don't know what you did or said, but you got awarded it. And you and I said, so what exactly does this mean? He said, you have a full scholarship. And not only that, they're going to give you a monthly stipend to help with rent. And they're also going to help you move into your own place. They're going to pay the first and last month's rent. They're going to pay all the expenses to start the utilities. All you have to do is just start paying rent and you start paying the first months of utilities as you get the bills. And I'm like, seriously? He goes, yes, I was floored. I was floored. And I was like, oh my God, this actually worked. And all I did was I wrote it down on a piece of paper put it up where I could see it every day so that it was in my consciousness and I expected it to happen. I assumed that it was already done. I was just waiting for it to show up. And I listened to those little nudges of what to do next, all the while feeling as if it was already done. I just needed to wait for it to arrive. And it's like, so, okay, this is exactly like when you order food online, okay? so. You go to Uber Eats or Grubhub or whatever it is that you use, or just even call the restaurant and say, hey, I want to order food for delivery. They're like, okay, cool. What do you want? So you figure out what you want, okay? You order it. You pay for it over the the phone or over the app. And then it says, um, order received. Order confirmed. They're making your order. And you're like, Hell yeah, woohoo, because you know your food is on the way. You just have to wait for the delivery driver to show up, right? So while you wait, what do you do? Okay, you pull out the plates, the napkins, the cutlery, you set the table, you get your beverages ready, and then bam, the driver arrives and you eat. You eat. This is what actions, quote unquote actions, will look like for you. One, figure out what you want. Two, put in your order. Three, you begin to operate under the assumption that your wish is fulfilled, your order is on the way. And embody that feeling that what you have, what you want is done. It's just being delivered. It literally is that simple. It is that simple. Like you don't second guess whether or not you're gonna get your food when you've You've ordered it, you've got a confirmation like, yes, boom, we're done. So some of you might say, well, what if I go into this, this, you know, visualization of something that I want and I don't get the confirmation? Start looking and you're going to start to see the confirmation. You're going to start to see these little tiny things that line up that are telling you that the wheels are in motion. So I want to read a few stories from the book of, it's called The Power of Awareness. And this is the Tarcher Cornerstone Edition that illustrates what others have experienced. And I want to share with these, these, these stories with you in hopes that they will inspire you to try this method in your life. Okay? All right. So... The first one is this. This is a story of a very unexpected result of an interview with a lady who came to consult me. Now again, this is from The Power of Awareness by Neville Goddard. If you have the um, Tarcher Cornerstone edition, this is on page 88. You can follow along if you'd like. So, and I quote, One afternoon, a young grandmother, a businesswoman in New York, came to see me. She brought along her nine-year-old grandson, who was visiting 
from his home in Pennsylvania. In response to her questions, I explained the law of assumption, describing in detail the procedure to be followed in obtaining the objective. The boy sat quietly, apparently absorbed in a small toy truck, while I explained the grandmother the method of assuming the state of consciousness that would be hers were her desire already fulfilled. I told her the story of the soldier in the camp who each night fell asleep, imagining himself to be in his own bed in his own home. This is another story that he had earlier in the book. When the boy and his grandmother were leaving, he looked up at me with great excitement and said, I know what I want and now I know how to get it. Surprised, I asked him what he wanted and he told me that his, he had his heart set on a puppy. Uh, to this, his grandmother vigorously protested, telling the boy that it had been made clear repeatedly that he could not have a dog under any circumstances, that his father and mother would not allow it, and that the boy was too young to care for it properly, and furthermore, the father had a deep dislike for dogs. He actually hated to have one around. All of these arguments were mute to the boy. Now I know what to do, he said. Every night, just as I go off to sleep, I'm going to pretend that I have a dog and we are going for a walk. No, said the grandmother, that is not what Mr. Neville means. This is not meant for you, you cannot have a dog. Approximately six weeks later, the grandmother told me what was to her an astonishing story. The boy's desire to own a dog was so intense that he had absorbed all that I had told his grandmother of how to obtain one's desire. And he believed implicitly that at least he knew how to get a dog. Putting this belief into practice, for many nights the boy imagined a dog was lying in his bed beside him. In imagination, he petted the dog, actually feeling its fur. Things like playing with the dog and taking it for a walk filled his mind. And again, the boy is imagining this act. He's embodying it. Just as when you did the ladder exercise as you were falling asleep, you envisioned that ladder in front of you. You envisioned climbing that ladder. It's the same thing that he's doing, but he's doing it with a dog. Within a few weeks, it happened. A newspaper in the city, which the boy lived in, organized a special program in connection with Kindness to Animals Week. All school children were requested to write an essay on why I would like to own a dog. After entries from all the schools were submitted and judged, the winner of the contest was announced. The very same boy who weeks before in my apartment in New York told me now I know how to get a dog, was the winner. In an elaborate ceremony, which was publicized with stories and pictures in the newspaper, the boy was awarded a beautiful collie puppy. In relating this story, the grandmother told me that if the boy had been given the money with which to buy a dog, the parents would have refused to do so and would have used it to buy a bond for the boy or put it in a savings bank for him. Furthermore, if someone had made the boy a gift of a dog, they would have refused it or given it away. But the dramatic manner in which the boy got the dog, the way he won the citywide contest, the stories and pictures in the newspaper, the pride of achievement and joy of the boy himself all combined to bring about a change of heart in the parents. And they found themselves doing that which they never conceived possible. They allowed him to keep the dog. All this, the grandmother explained to me, and she concluded by saying that there was one particular kind of dog on which the boy had set his heart. It was a collie. So as you can see, the boy did exactly what Neville instructed. You envision this thing as if it's already yours, as if you're already experiencing it and doing it and being it. In this you know, instance, the boy imagined petting the dog and playing with the dog and walking the dog. Same thing, as you're falling asleep, envision and imagine yourself achieving or having done or doing that thing that you want to bring about in your life. Now, when I wrote, I want a car, I want you know cash for a car and I want to go to college, Every moment of the day, I was envisioning that. I was envisioning having that new car. I was envisioning 
being able to go to college. I was anticipating moving. I was I was like, yes, okay, I am so excited for this. You know, what am I going to study? What classes am I going to take? And I started to plan in my head what I was going to do once I got that letter saying, yay, you've been accepted into such and such college. So you really have to just start to embody and live from that place of your wish fulfilled. Now, here's another story, and this one is incredible. If you have the book, um, it is on page 97. The man and wife in the story have attended my lectures for a number of years. It is an interesting illustration of conscious use of this law by two people concentrating on the same objective at one time. This man and wife were an exceptionally devoted couple. For some time, they had planned to move into a larger apartment. The more they thought about, the more they realized that what they had their hearts set on was a beautiful penthouse. In discussing it together, the husband explained that he wanted one with a huge window looking out on a magnificent view. The wife said she would like to have one side of the walls mirrored from top to bottom. They both wanted to have a wood-burning fireplace. It was a must that the apartment be in New York City. For months, they had searched for just such an apartment in vain. In fact, the situation in the city was such that securing any kind of apartment was almost an impossibility. They were so scarce that not only were there waiting lists for them, but all sorts of special deals, including premiums and buying of furniture that were involved. New apartments were being leased long before they were completed, many being rented from the blueprints of the building. Early in the spring, after months of fruitless seeking, they finally located one which they seriously considered. It was a penthouse apartment in a building just be completed on the upper Fifth Avenue facing Central Park. It had one serious drawback, being a new building was not subject to rent control and the couple felt that the yearly rent was exorbitant. In fact, it was several thousand dollars a year more than what they had considered paying. During the spring months of March and April, they continued looking at various penthouses throughout the city, but they always came back to this one. Finally, they decided to increase the amount they would pay substantially and made a proposition which the agent for the building agreed to forward to the owners for consideration. It was at this point, without discussing it with each other, each determined to apply the law of assumption. It was not until later that each learned what the other had done. Night after night, they both fell asleep in imagination in the apartment they were considering. The husband, lying with his eyes closed, would imagine that his bedroom windows were overlooking the park. He would imagine going to the window the first thing in the morning and enjoying the view. He felt himself sitting on the terrace, overlooking the park, having cocktails with his wife and friends, and thoroughly enjoying it. He filled his mind with the actual feeling of himself being in the penthouse and on the terrace. During all this time, unknown to him, his wife was doing the same thing. Several weeks went by without any decision on the part of the owners, but they continued to imagine as they fell asleep each night that they were actually sleeping in the penthouse. One day, to their complete surprise, one of the employees in the apartment building in which they lived told them that the penthouse there was vacant. They were astonished because theirs was one of the most desirable buildings in the city with a perfect location right on Central Park. They knew there was a long waiting list of people trying to get an apartment in their building. The fact that a penthouse had unexpectedly become unavailable was kept quiet by the management because they were not in a position to consider any applicants for it. Upon learning that it was vacant, this couple immediately made a request that it be rented to them only to be told that this was impossible. The fact was that not only were there several people on the waiting list for a penthouse in the building, but it was actually promised to one family. Despite this, the couple had a series of meetings with the management, at the conclusion of which the apartment was theirs. The building being subject to rent control, their rental was just about what they had planned to pay when they first started looking for a penthouse. The location, the apartment itself, and the large terrace surrounding it on the south, west, and north was beyond their expectation. 
And in the living room on one side is a giant window 15 feet by 8 feet with a magnificent view of Central Park. One wall is mirrored from floor to ceiling and there is a wood burning fireplace. End quote. Everything that that couple wanted, they got. Every single night, they envisioned themselves in that apartment. They envisioned waking up. They envisioned all the things. They truly assumed the feeling of their wish being fulfilled. It truly is that simple. So as you can see from these case histories, that if you just get clear about what you want, what you desire, and be in the assumption of already having it or it already being done, then you just have to look for the signs that it's coming and that it's here and you will get that desire. Now, yes, you do have to take action, but that action is, oh, hey, go talk to the manager. Oh, hey, go write that letter. Or, oh, hey, go talk to that person. Or you know, send this email or go to this website. Whatever it is that you put out there, whatever it is that you start to embody and you assume it is done, what happens is you will get these tiny nudges like, hey, you want a car? What kind of a car do you want? Okay, I started looking. I narrowed it down to two types. I found one, I called, found out exactly how much it was gonna cost and I was like, oh, okay. And every day I like envisioned myself in this little echo. But again, every day there was nothing. But I just kept envisioning. I'm like, it's mine. It's coming. It's here. It's coming. It's coming. I'm super excited. It's coming. Is it outside yet? Not yet. Is it outside yet? Not yet. Boom. Hey, you got to do your taxes. Boom. Okay, go do my taxes. Hey, guess what? We double withheld. You get $8,009 back. <gasps> What was the next action? Call the lady. Hey, I got 8,000. You good? She's like, I'm good. I'm like, woohoo. How the heck do I get there? Call my stepsister. Hey, you want to go for a road trip? She's like, hell yeah, let's do it. Boom. So you are going to have to take action. By thought, that thing is brought to you. By action, you receive it. For the, for the child, he envisioned every single night petting that dog, walking that dog. What was his action that he was guided to do? Boom. There's an opportunity that allowed him to write that essay. He wrote the essay, his desires, everything fell into place for him to get the dog the way that it did, that it, you know came about with all of this pomp and circumstance and all the hubba blue that changed the heart and mind of his parents for him to keep the dog. When I envisioned college, I was like, I want to pay, I want somebody to pay me to go to college. I want to be able to take care of my babies. I want to be able to go to college and focus on my studies and not have to worry about anything. Now, did I get a huge exorbitant amount every month from the government? No, I got just enough to cover my rent. I did work study that paid for gas and my groceries and my utilities. But I allowed myself to own it and say, yes. I'm getting that college education. Yes, I'm getting a scholarship. Yes, it is done. I'm just waiting for somebody to tell me, hey, you want a scholarship? Woo, woo, cool. Okay, but the actions was, hey, I need to start working with this person. Hey, let's find a job. Mm, not really liking this. I kind of want to go to college. Okay, fill out this form. Okay, fill out this form. So yes, there was things, there was actions to do but they're divinely guided actions that are bringing you closer. In the book, Write It Down, Make It Happen, um, there's a woman that talks about creating a, a list of what she really wanted in her new home. And um, I'm, I hesitate to read it because I don't wanna make this episode too, too long. But essentially, her list was two bedrooms, one for my daughter, one for me, two bathrooms so we don't run into each other, a garage with an automatic garage door opener, and a view of the water. Also, someplace quiet, beautiful, and serene. And this woman had 
Like, she literally had had a shit show of a couple of years before that. She was an author. Her book got published. And then the publishing company went under. Never paid her for her work. Um, she pretty much lost everything. And she's like, oh, my gosh. She had a tiny bit amount of money in savings. And she discovered Henriette Clauser's work, Write It Down, Make It Happen. Um, but it was actually through her first book. I can't remember what it was called. But... Um, you know, she was like, oh, it's called writing on both sides of the brain. Put your heart on paper. And so the woman's like, all right, I'm just going to make a list and I'm just going to expect it to happen. And she looked. So once she wrote down what she wanted in a home, what did she do? She didn't just sit there. She started to look at home listings in her area. She's like, all right, I'm going to look for houses. I'm going to look for houses. And she found one in... It was a um, an ad, and it just said, two bedroom, two baths, garage, partial view of Puget Sound. She called, got an appointment with the homeowner, saw the house. It was between her and somebody else. This woman was self-employed, looked really bad on paper, but she had six months worth of rent that she could pay up front. And they're like, all right, boom, there you go. She got what she wanted. She put it down. She visualized it. She expected it to happen. If you have tried to do this for yourself in the past, but it hasn't manifested, it hasn't worked, please don't give up. I promise you that this will be your reality. This will be a way that you begin to manifest and bring things in your life. So recently, my partner and I decided to downsize from what we have into something smaller. So we moved from Wisconsin to Arizona. We moved from a 2,000 square foot house. It was three bedroom, two baths, split level on two acres. We downsized kind of from a you know 2,000 square foot house to a 1,400 square foot house. It's still three bedroom, two bath. It's on a very small plot of land in town. And we decided to lease for two years. All of a sudden, we both kind of looked at each other one day and we're just like, hey, are you ready to downsize yet? And he's like, yeah, let's do this. So we wanted a one bedroom, one bath apartment with a garage at a resort style um, place. So well, several Saturdays ago, um, we decided, hey, let's drive around and start looking at apartments. We had no intention of going and touring, but we were just going to look at areas and locations and things like that so we drove through the first space it was okay it was an it, it, okay it was just okay <laughs> lots of little things that were okay lots of little things that were maybe not so much we drove a half a block down the street we saw this beautiful beautiful sign we pulled in instantly i felt at home i'm like um yes Everything yes, everything yes. So we go in there, we ask to see someone. Both of them are, are you know open. We tour, we love it. We fill out an application, we're approved pretty much on the spot. We put in our down payment <clears throat> and we're set to move once this lease is finished. And it was less than an hour. It was so serendipitous and it was so fast. It was so fast. So truly allow yourself to tap into your imagination and use the power of assumption. Remember how effortless it was to create the situation where you climbed the ladder. That is how this works. You know, as Neville says, creation is already done. You just have to order what you want and be in the energy of the wish fulfilled and then allow yourself to take those divinely guided actions. That's it, that's it. So I'm gonna list these books in the show notes, Write It Down, Make It Happen, and The Power of Awareness by Neville Goddard. Check them out, read them, study them. They are going to change your life. Remember, all it takes is a clear vision of what you want and the willingness to take a small one degree shift in that direction daily to get a life that you love. I hope this serves you today. I love you and I will see you in the next episode. 
If you're enjoying this content, which I hope you are, and you're applying this knowledge in your life and are seeing results, I would love to hear about your successes. Click the link in today's show notes, share your success story with me so you can help to inspire others. Also, if you've been loving these episodes, it would mean the world to me if you would rate this podcast on iTunes. A five-star rating is what I always aim for. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. All links mentioned are in today's show notes.